Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Lizzie Gillett, the producer of The Age of Stupid. This is Franny. And as time is very short, both with the session today and with the climate crisis, we're going to be quick. We have a plan. We're going to do two minute, it's a tag team effort. We're going to do two minute um, kind of stints on the, the big topics that we wanted to cover. So, first off, we have Franny with McLeibel. And if people, if the tech team can project the um, internet onto so the screen. Are you timing it? I'm going to time it, yes. Okay. Hi, and I'm go. <laughs> So uh, it all started um, with an idea. I was actually a drummer in a rock band, um, but then I heard about this trial starting up in 96, um, uh, where these two people were, got sued by McDonald's, and these two people said that they were going to stand up and fight McDonald's. And I just thought that this, this was the greatest story I ever heard. And uh, my dad's a filmmaker, so I happened to have access to filmmaking equipment, so I thought, I'll make these guys a little video um, to help their campaign. And, um, and uh, I, I went about it in the normal way at first, even though I had no uh, experience in filmmaking or anything, and tried to get a commission off the BBC and Channel 4 and ITV and all the rest of them. And, um, but the problem was that they'd all been sued by McDonald's or had legal trouble with McDonald's in the past. Uh, and so none of them would commission a film about this story. And so uh, I was forced to, to make that film using the rich boyfriend uh, maxing credit cards funding model. And, uh, <laughs> Which was fine. Um, I left, uh, you know, went on the dole, lived in a squat, that kind of thing. Um, and ten years later, that film ended up being, being seen by 25 million people. And the BFI, in fact, included it in there as the only British film other than Michael Burke's Live Aid, original Live Aid thing, as uh, the ten documentaries which changed the world, which was very exciting. Um, anyway, but what I realised, having made it with no funding and no backing, is that it's all about controlling the rights and owning the rights to your film. Because basically, I finished the f making the film, and then I could do whatever I wanted with it. And if, it had, if I had taken the commission, then it would have belonged to uh, the BBC or whoever. They would have put it on TV once or twice, whatever. And then that would have been it. There probably wouldn't even have been a DVD. Uh, certainly wouldn't have been international uh, screenings and all the rest of it. Um, so this is back then in 97 or whenever it was, is when I started inventing all my techniques, to which I believe Lizzie is showing. Yeah, these are all the screenings that ended up. That's how we reached 25 okay, million. Your, your time is up. That was it. I just yeah. ended. Good. Next. So when we came to do um, Age of Stupid, which was called Crude when we started back in 2004, we knew that we wanted, uh, we needed a proper budget-ish to make it about half a million pounds. And the rich boyfriend had long since departed, <laughs> and the credit cards had been maxed out. So we came up with this idea to sell shares um, in the film, and we called it crowdfunding. We put it on our website, and we said, come along like next week um, to buy the first shares in our new film, Crude. And we were working with Passion Pictures, John Batsacker, Passion Pictures, and his lawyer phoned up and said, this film financing scheme is the most original I've seen in 25 years in the industry, but it's completely illegal. Um, so that was kind of bad. Um, but we, we legalized it. We found out you can't call them shares because they're not actually shares. They're limited recourse debenture loans, which no one's going to buy. So we call them shares. So we have to always say that. So we started off with 100 shares of £500 each, and we did an event. We kept it kind of secret at the beginning, and it was a very small group of people. We pitched it. We had nothing apart from an idea at that stage, and we told people the idea was a bit crap. If you go on our website, you can see our initial pitch, which wasn't that good. Um, but on the very first night, we raised, I think it was £37,000. And so we went on with this crowdfunding to fund the entire budget. Um, we went up to £5,000 shares, and now that shares, sorry, and now they're £10,000 shares. And as we've gone on, the percentage of profits that people get has got lower because the risk was so much higher at the beginning. And our initial pitch uh, was that if we made as much as Franny's uh, past documentary drowned out for your £500, you'd get 50. But if we did as well as Michael Moore's Fahrenheit 9-11, you'd get £64,000. So just put that, those ideas into people's heads, you know. <laughs> Um, and we always thought that we'd have to get some kind of traditional film financing along the way, because £500,000, starting with friends and people you know, is a lot of money to raise. Um, but as it turned out, the shares got more and more popular. And um, in fact, the £5,000 ones and the £10,000 ones have been easier to sell than the uh, initial £500 ones. I forgot to time you, sorry. Ah. And the, the great thing about crowdfunding is not just the money. Um, we kept co complete control of the rights. We did it to keep control of the film editorially keep control of the rights and so that the people who worked on it and believed in it in the beginning stages would be the people to benefit. Okay, don't forget time. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
Lizzie just threw away one of the main benefits, which is complete editorial control, because with a subject like climate change, we didn't want to have some ex commissioning editor or an advertising person telling us that we had to water down our film, uh, you know, because they were getting funding from, you know, Shell, for example, picking a name out of the hat. So, um, but one of the problems with it is that you don't then get the exec commissioners, uh, commissioning editors that come along if you do get a commission. So we, that was one thing we did want to make sure we had. So we did have a lot of uh, that kind of people involved who were always helping us along, along the way. So we had four um, exec producers anyway. So we finished the film, Age of Stupid, which, which was then called. And then we was like, well, what are we going to do with it? And because um, John Batsack is the exec producer of the film. You know, he's made really big hit films like One Day in September and In the Shadow of the Moon and stuff like that. And what he usually does with his films is sells them all right uh, to a big distributor. Um, and he gets $2 million or something, something like that. So we did consider that option. But the problem with that is what might happen is, you know, you might make a big sale, which is great, but then the complete control of your film is then handed to that um, distributor. You know, and this is really what happened with Leonardo DiCaprio's film Eleventh Hour, where Warner Brothers bought it and then um, pretty much shelved it. And there's, not, there's nothing then that the filmmaker can do, which is just, you know, we were desperate for that not to happen because, uh, well, because cause it's our film, of course, but more importantly because of climate change. Um, so we didn't want to go down that road of selling all the rights. So then the next option is either to go completely alone or to get a sales agent who's basically representing you. And so we went to meet all the sales agents. And then one of the best ones in the whole world, Celluloid Dreams, they, they wanted to take it. And so um, th this is a year ago now. So we, we decided to go down the route of having the sales agent who would be out there making deals. And uh, we absolutely love Celluloid, and Celluloid absolutely loves us. But on the other hand, we do create problems for them because we've basically um, been you know, we're obsessed with our film and we're out there all the time striking up all sorts of bizarre deals and kind of treading on their toes in, in a way. So perhaps with the benefit of hindsight, it might have been better for us not to have a sales agent um, because so that we would be completely free and so also we wouldn't be annoying them. Um, okay, time's up. Really? Yeah, sure, because okay. um, what we um, have been... Oh, it's helping. Yeah. Celluloid do seem to think it's a bit strange as there are sales agents and we're kind of always phoning them and saying, can you please stop selling? Yeah. Can you stop selling to any territories? Because when they've made specific deals like Canada, for example, we sold all rights very early on um, for not a huge amount of money. And then when we have these bizarre ideas that we want to do, these huge kind of global theatrical events, you don't want to exclude any territories whatsoever. Um, so it would have been really great to have Canada ourselves, but by then we'd already sold it off. Um, so once we'd made the film and we were deciding how to get it out, um, we came up with this idea of a UK uh, people's premiere, we called it. And it was um, held simultaneously across the UK. It broke a Guinness, it made a Guinness, new Guinness World Record for the largest ever simultaneous uh, film screening. 62 satellite cinemas all had the same event. They had the live content from Leicester Square where we set up a solar powered cinema tent and we did an eco premiere with a green carpet and celebrities and various uh, political figures speaking live to the people around the country. So it wasn't just the film, people went um, along for the event and to be part of a premiere as well. Um, so we had that event in the UK and we did that was a one day only kind of theatrical event and then we also did a kind of traditional theatrical release in this country and we were in cinemas for about six weeks um, in the West End and we took we were the number one box office opening weekend something like that. Um, and our UK premiere, we were trying to walk the, walk the walk as well as talk the talk, and it only had 1% of the carbon emissions of a typical Hollywood-style premiere. So on the basis that we had the Guinness World Record as a simultaneous event and the eco side of it, we got a lot of press out of it, and that's been really great for the other kind of uh, revenue streams and distribution models that we've been pursuing. Time up. <laughs> You're not talking. <laughs> But it was actually one of the, um, the brilliant satellite people, because this idea was quite new. I know everybody's doing these satellite events now, which are extremely brilliant. And I really recommend you do one if you can. Um, but they haven't been going very long. Um, and the, the satellite people we used, which were called um, in the UK. Quantum. Thank you. Um, he said to us, as we were like doing our event, we were in Leicester Square, we had all the satellite trucks, they were linking. He was like, why are we only doing global? This satellite thing here, it can link to the globe. I mean, why are we only doing UK? You know, that satellite dish can link to the globe, which is obviously a fatal uh, thing to say to us. And that's where the idea for the global premiere <laughs> was born, which we're getting onto next. But what I'm talking about is indie screenings. Oh, good. Um, because 
obviously we own all the rights to the film and um, with my McLibel film and also another film I made called Drowned Out, loads of people wrote to us saying we want to screen the film in our you know, school, church, whatever business um, and I would make these arrangements one at a time, you know, yeah, okay, 300 quid for you, okay, here's the DVD, post it back and it was all quite um, labour intensive. So it was quite an obvious idea to start a system um, so that just an automatic system so people could come in and book their own screenings which we launched in May, here it is, Indie Screenings. And basically it just asks you a few questions like where you are, where you're going to do your screening, how many people are going to go and stuff like that. And then you pay your licence fee, which comes direct to us. Um, but then the key thing is you can hold your screening and you can charge for tickets so everybody can profit from our film, which is really a very a different thing. And then see? here's the back end, which you're now going to be privy to. 781 screenings, £66,162 for 37p. 100% of which comes to us with not, no middleman involved. Um, that money, obviously, we had to pay off the, to make the, the software that, we, that got written. But apart from that, it's 100% to the filmmakers, i.e. us. In our PayPal account, no exhibitor, no distributor, yeah. no sales agent. Because one of the things you find out when you've got a film and you start selling it to people and is, is that you know, the, the money gets lost along the way in all the different middlemen, and none of it comes back to you. you know, either, either just distributors completely ripping you off uh, which is quite common, particularly in America. We've got quite a few court cases going on where we're trying to get money back from stupid deals we've made in the past, um, or just deals which are, you know, not not good for the filmmaker. So this this one is a <laughs> is a much better. Um, and anyway, so it's 700 and something screenings just in the UK since May. Um, can you show the map so you can see all the? I was going to show that list of all yeah, all well, the list, yeah. yeah. And now we've just launched it globally, um, indie screenings. That is, like last week, and so now it's going to be international. And if you list by um, country here, yeah, you can see the, the different number in the various countries around the world. Those are all the upcoming ones. Um, but what we're going to do with indie screenings, which you might be interested in, is we're going to start um, adding, ad adding other films to it. So other filmmakers, if you've got um, any great films on the shelf not being seen, uh, give us a bell. OK. Actually, switch. email us. Huh? It's tiring, this, isn't it? Should we just stick? Um, so how do you get people to see your film and you know it's really hard to get people to enter the cinema to see films in general but independent political documentaries about climate change subtitled subtitled quite no hard advertising. yeah no advertising budget quite hard too um, but we had the crowdfunding model where we had over 228 investors who had funded the film and they were all complete obsessive fans then we had 105 crew who had worked on it over the seven years or six years in different countries and they were all obsessive fans this is mostly in the UK so these were like huge promotional efforts going on by each person uh, around the UK. We worked out about a thousand people worked on our UK People's <laughs> Premiere. We had local speakers in each cinema, in the 62 cinemas. We had two speakers, one representing the national and one representing a local organisation. Um, and our UK distributor, Dogwoof Indy, estimated that um, having local speakers at a documentary cinema event increases ticket sales by about 40%. Um, and so we involved a lot of people uh, in the process of, of the premiere. Uh, but what we did um, as a, one of our main strategies was to work with uh, NGO partners. So we worked with Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth and a huge number now globally we've worked with, it must be in the, I don't know, 50s or something, of different organisations um, to help get the word out. And so you can offer them incentives. So when we came to do the global event, um, we, we were you know, trying to figure out how are we going to get these NGO partners in every country. So we employed a global NGO coordinator and she had about five kind of interns working for her. And then we offered it to our main partners like Greenpeace and um, Move On in the States. We offered them to be a country hub. And if you were the hub in a country, you got to assign the local speakers to a cinema. You got to assign the host. So in Germany, our hub had 30 cinemas where they could fly, they could sign people up to their mailing list they could um, provide the speaker. So we worked with our NGO partners to what, what they always want is people interested in their campaign and we're trying to get people into the cinema. Uh, together we're trying to achieve the same aim. Um, but to, to tow that line with the cinemas who are just trying to make money does get quite difficult. Um, okay, you're up, I think. Okay. Um, one of the problems that we... Uh with this particular film, we have a very strict, we have a very strict deadline, because I'm sure you all know about Copenhagen, because you're all up on climate change. But all of your futures, and in fact everybody's and the planet's future, is going to be decided in 55 days' time at Copenhagen at the UN Climate Summit, um, where the world's leaders are going to make the new climate uh, agreement. And at the moment, it's useless and we're all going to die, but we've got 55 <laughs> days to turn it around. So we had this very, very... Um, 
a strict deadline, which um, means that we've got to do as much as we possibly can. Again, this is something that we were rubbing up against with Celluloid, our sales agent, because we were saying we, we would rather it goes on TV and you get less money or just give it away for free as long as it's before Copenhagen. And they were just like... <laughs> um, not appreciating that concept. Um, but, um, you know, one of the reasons we've been doing these single big events rather than schlepping around to every film festival um, is, is from the climate change point of view in that we don't want to fly... Um, you know, we, we only did uh, America. And, but we made, we made the decision that we would do Australia and New Zealand as well in August, because it would only, in theory, take us two weeks to do, to pull off the whole thing. And uh, Australia and New Zealand are very behind on climate change, so there's a long way for them to go before Copenhagen. And we hope that we could um, uh, move, you know, move the politics a little bit. Um. And the other good thing with the live events is that when you have a film that's kind of as truthful as ours about climate change, it's pretty bleak because the truth is very bleak. But if you have this live event afterwards, you know, you can have the kind of razzmatazz of the green carpet, lure people in with the <laughs> celebs and sex appeal kind of thing. Then you have the film, and then afterwards you can have a live panel that really addresses the question of what can I do once you've seen the film. You know, what can I do? And um, for our global event, we had Kofi Annan speaking and the president of the Maldives, um, a lot of uh, political figures. But um, with Australia, I mean, one of the problems that we've really had is that, we're, you know, there's too few of us and uh, there's not enough time. So perhaps it was a mistake to do Australia. I don't know. Um, because we were also having to do the DVD at the same time because the DVD really had, has to come out again before Copenhagen. And uh, we kept missing our deadlines. Sorry about that to all the distributors. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> Um, so we were making this, and obviously, being us, we you know we had to be a double disc DVD with lots of six hours of extras. And this is the list of extras. I mean, it's <laughs> and 31 languages, all subtitled by volunteers. Um, so, um, but we did do it, and it is uh, it is coming out soon. Um, but I think um, th again, this is about how to outreach. You know, Amazon got in touch with us, a really really nice guy there who's uh, got a strange job title like the sustainability guy. So. And he was like, look, we want to, you know, we really care about climate change. Can we help you push your film and stuff like that? So Amazon have been really helping us uh, by giving, giving us these email blasts and things like that. Um, we actually got to number four in the Amazon charts, which is uh, not bad for zero advertising. And the fact that it wasn't done, finished. Um, okay, that's it. And Do so in September, the event that we've just come back from that Liz was referring to was our global premiere. We took the idea from the UK and we did it on a global scale. It was 63 countries, over a million people participated somehow, and it was live. So we did a live event from downtown Manhattan, only a block from the World Trade Center pit, and which was a bit of a bureaucratic nightmare. We had to put in 12 um, internet lines. Uh, because we were doing a live link up with the Himalayas and so to have enough bandwidth. Um, it was quite funny because it was supposed to be, all be this really high tech. It was delivered in HD and 5.1 sound to 400 cinemas across America, mainstream cinemas. So everything in the contract, you know, it had to be done by satellite and things like that. But uh, the satellite went down, the link to the ship in the Arctic. So we actually had to use Skype um, for the live, uh, live link ups with the Himalayas. But it did look really brilliant. And so we've just done this big event and you can see the, the various people that we had there. Moby played live, um, Radiohead's Tom York played, um, he wasn't actually in the tent, he played via satellite link up as well, 5.1 HD. <laughs> we were trying to show that you don't have to fly absolutely everybody in to a central event to do something really powerful. But we, have, we are in a, un, you know, in a very lucky position with this particular film because, um, because of climate change and Copenhagen and everything. Um, what we're actually doing at the moment is we're selling some of our own shares. If anybody would like to buy one, please buy one. Only um, £10,000. <laughs> But we're selling our own shares to, to raise the money to do things like this, which are very expensive. And in a, a normal situation of a documentary, you wouldn't have the money to be able to do this. But we're realizing that we would rather not you know, sell our own shares, invest in doing a massive big event like this on the off chance that we can influence Copenhagen. So it is quite an unusual situation. Yeah, so we sold, for, to make the film, it was about 500,000 um, pounds. And we kind of raised the money as we were going, but we would kind of get it and then spend it. Whereas with the um, global premiere, or with all the promotion and the distribution, it's going to cost us probably about half that, or maybe you know getting close to two thirds of that. And in some instances, in instances we kind of just had to spend it, um, mm -hmm. you know, because it's your events coming up so soon, and it's this huge global event. And countries kept wanting to sign up, and if, you know they don't have any money, but they want to be involved in your global premiere. So what are you going to say? <laughs> Time's up. Time's up completely. <laughs> One question. <laughs> It's all really simple. <laughs> and not hard work. Yes. <coughs> On which format did, did, you, did you distribute your film? Every format, apart from film. So it's on uh, HD Cam SR. 
uh, dig mainly on digital hard drives actually yeah. because Arts Alliance in, in America we worked with Fathom NCM to do the live one day only event. It's quite cool actually because instead of having tapes or hard drives they um, stream the film itself along with the event to the 400 cinemas so from an environmental perspective you have a very small footprint because there are no tapes, no hard drives. Um, but for the rest of the world we had to do DCPs um, with the different languages, we had 32 languages. Um, we did some screenings on DVD and that kind of thing. We're now moving into download and internet. And the auteurs helped us with them. Um, they made it free in countries where we didn't have a cinema deal. Um, they made it free on the internet, so we geo-blocked it so that if you were in one of these countries listed below, you could watch it for free. But I think um, you know, one of the, the brilliant things about keeping the rights and, and having the film is that we've been doing all sorts of bizarre deals. All sorts of people have been coming to us, like, for example, John Prescott. Um, is doing a campaign in schools this uh, now and a climate campaign before Copenhagen and he said can I have a 20 minute edit of your film and I'm going to take it in all schools you know but I'm like yes off you go John Prescott you know and, and the um, Ministry of Defence the Ministry of Defence yeah. they want the version without war they want us to enough. cut the war out <laughs> Because there's, there's a whole kind of Iraqi uh, yeah. scene. And with our indie screenings, we've been able to do blanket licenses. Like with the NHS, we did a blanket license. So for two years, they can screen the film as much as they like. They paid us a lump sum up front. And they can screen it as much as they like in any hospital or NHS staff building. The TfL have done that. Um, the Foreign That's Office, London, the British Council. Quite a lot yeah. of these kind of blanket license deals. We just made a deal with the British Council to screen in every um, British Council all around the world, in every country, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. On their, in their offices. So um, anything goes, really, as long Hi. as you own the rights. That's it from us. And if you want to sign right. up to our mailing list, <laughs> yes. you can Last go on our question. website. <laughs> Did we not bring any? Actually, we do have a mailing list, um, which is really the best way to keep in touch if anybody wants to follow the uh, adventures um, of Age of Stupid up to Copenhagen. Um, we'll pass around some pieces of paper. And please give us your email. Anybody Good. else have a question? Go on. The, the, uh, your indie screening um, project, is that you said you're going to open that up to um, other filmmakers. Is that on a... A commercial basis, and uh, are you, will you be curating that in some way? Or I can't see where you are, but anyway. I'm over here, the right are you the back. over there. Hello. Yeah. Um, we actually haven't decided exactly how we're going to do it. Um, it will be commercial, yeah, absolutely. We'll take a cut, um, and then give all the rest of the money to the filmmaker or the distributor if the distri if you have a distributor who's making the deal with us. But this is only the um, uh, what they call the non-theatric rights. So you've only got to control the non-theatric rights of your film to be able to sign up to indie screenings, which most distributors don't care about. Um, so if your luck's in and you've already signed to a distributor, you may have got the non-theatric rights, or at least non-exclusive. And obviously, we only want them non-exclusive. We don't care. Um, but we don't actually want to run indie screenings. We don't want to be distributors. So we're, gonna, we're, we're trying to find somebody to take it over. And then once they're taken it over, we'll decide. I mean, personally, I'm in favor of having once a month a new film. And always, it's always a change the world type film. But we'll see. It may be any old film. Cool. Time's up. Thanks, guys. <laughs>